You know, ever since we first checked out the AWE Jimmy Neutron game, I've had this unusual desire for more. By all conventional standards, it wasn't a very good game, with goofy graphics, terrible controls, not so great writing, and that one scene that still bothers me. Is it dangerous? By all means, I shouldn't have enjoyed it as much as I did. But all that aside, you can tell a great deal of effort went into it. With a wide array of mechanics and open-world settings, you can tell the developers actually cared about it and wanted to make a proper video game. I respect AWE a lot. Even if their games aren't exactly the highest quality, they never cease to retain my interest. Despite its flaws, Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius is really fun and I don't regret giving it a go. So when I heard it had a sequel, I just had to check it out. It was called Jimmy Neutron vs. Jimmy Negatron. It came out in 2002 and introduced a new antagonist called Jimmy Negatron. He was supposed to appear in the show at some point, but never ended up making it in. He's like Jimmy Neutron, but he has a beard. It's been pointed out that this is likely a reference to Spock's evil counterpart in Star Trek, who had a goatee. Just wait until you see Anti Lucy. Also, his name was supposed to be Numi Jetron, and I kind of wish they kept it. It sounds silly, but it's clever. So let's take a look at AWE's beloved sequel, Jimmy Neutron vs. Jimmy Negatron. I'll be fine as long as Goddard doesn't talk in this one. Seriously, what was up with that? We start with some really cool opening titles. They didn't pull any punches with these. What a great way to start this adventure. Really gets you pumped up. So our story kicks off in the Retroville Museum, where Jimmy's class is on a boring field trip. Yes, that background music was used in the AWE Spongebob games. The recycling of music extended beyond franchises. So Jimmy is upset because Miss Fowl is making his beloved science boring, which is kind of funny. The dialogue in this game has been heavily improved from how it was in the first. Characters actually have full-fledged conversations now, so there's a lot less of this. My therapist warned me about you, Jimmy. There are no such things as aliens. Oh no! Women. But there's a trade-off. The cutscenes are very long. If you have to use the bathroom and you're waiting for a moment to pause, that's just too bad. This was AWE's way of getting back at the critics. They went, hey, you think our pacing is too fast? Well, here, how do you like this? So in another dimension, Jimmy's evil counterpart is in his undersea lab cooking up a scheme. I wonder if the events of Employee of the Month are happening right next door. I also love the little screens that come up before cutscene transitions. These are such nostalgic reminders of the time these games came out. In this other dimension is a boy named Jimmy Negatron. Evil boy genius. And if this boy has his way, things will change in Retroville. Hey, is that the voice of Jimmy's dad? Gotta love Hugh Neutron. Seriously, why is every work of fiction so obsessed with Box Toccata and Fugue in D minor? So the evil Jimmy wants to take over good Jimmy's dimension. He also bosses his henchman Herman around. Herman's really goofy and a nice addition to the story. So Negatron's plan is to lock onto the signal when Jimmy uses one of his inventions. Cartoon science and all that. To activate one of his inventions and I'll lock onto the signal. It'll be child's play. Evil child's play. <laughs> now this exhibit... Whoa, Cindy jump scare. She looks a little better than she did in the first one, but also a little uncanny. So she and Jimmy are having a scientific debate where Jimmy claims to have perfected time travel. Now for some reason, Jimmy brought this big time travel portal into the museum. This isn't really explained, nor is it explained how he brought this massive device in there or why, but just go with it. Maybe the museum is letting him keep it on display. To show Cindy that he can travel back in time, Jimmy uses his invention and allows Negatron to latch onto it. I've got the location. Time to swap briefly. Time for you and your barking toaster to be locked up while I have some fun. I have no idea what he just said. Time for you and your barking toaster to be- Did he say barking ghost? Is this a Goosebumps reference? So Jimmy appears in a cage and meets his counterpart. What? You- You look like me, but you're wearing a fake beard. What beard? Uh, huh? Did he mean to say something like, what do you mean, fake? Is the joke that he doesn't know he has a beard? That's just confusing. 
So Negatron leaves Herman to guard you as he goes to your dimension to take your place. So the first thing he does after returning is seduce Cindy, Jimmy's worst nightmare. He does this by giving her Black Flurp, his dimension's equivalent of Purple Flurp from the show. If you remember the last game, Cindy was obsessed with this drink, so hooray for continuity! In the other dimension, Jimmy fools Herman into letting him out by pretending to be Negatron. No oh, you don't! You're just trying to trick me! It won't work! I know that you are Jimmy Neutron! No! I'm Jimmy Negatron! Negative! You are Neutron! Negatron! Neutron! Negatron! Neutron! Neutron! Negatron! Neutron! No! I am positive you are my master, Jimmy Negatron! And I will do whatever you command! Oh, okay, if you insist. Um, let me out of this cage! Right away, master! And release the robot dog Goddard as well! Yes, of course! There, are you happy now? Yes, yes, master! <laughs> Command me again! Command me again! Okay, um, go play in the broom closet! At once, master! Okay, that takes care of that! Let's get out of here, Goddard! What? Ah, I think Goddard broke the world for a second there. So after that very long opening, you're thrown into the game and you'll quickly find the controls haven't been improved since the first one. It's hard to make Jimmy do what you want him to because the camera is locked in the direction you move, so walking around isn't a very comfortable procedure. The lab is a cool location, though. I love anything underwater. Looking out the window can show you the robot fish outside, which is kind of creepy, but awesome. I also love the posters of Negatron all throughout the base. They look like really old memes. This universe had impact font memes all the way back in 2002. They really were ahead of us. Around the base, you can find neutrons for health and devices to build later upgrades with. Your first invention is a water balloon launcher you can shoot at these flying enemies. The downside of this water balloon launcher is that you often have to stop and aim it with the arrow keys. It's a scary process when moving enemies are coming at you. Also, shooting it drains your health, and I can't say I like this feature very much. I criticized it in the last game, too. It seems like such an unnecessary obstacle. They add features into the game to make it more fun, so why do they punish you for using them? Especially since you have to use the water balloon launcher at several intervals, so it's counterintuitive to punish you for it. Goddard is also useful in this because he flies where you need to go. This can be useful in later stages. So once you shoot a target and clear a path, Negatron calls you on your PDA. Remember when every cartoon in the early 2000s was obsessed with these things? It's ironic because I've never known a single person who actually owned one. I don't think I've even seen one in real life. Actually, I don't even really know what they are. Let's look it up. Oh, it's a heart defect. So Cindy is enamored with Negatron, giving Jimmy motivation to stop him. He accidentally teleports somewhere else in the universe, so now you have to ride Goddard across this river to escape a giant wave of water behind you. Because you're being chased, you can't dilly-dally, but it's still enjoyable and you can find different paths to take and various ways to enjoy this level. Oh look, a mineshaft. I wonder if Shaggy is riding the tracks nearby. Once you get away from the wave, you reach this unsettling ghost town on a dock. What an ominous location. Silent Hill, Jimmy Neutron Edition. So Jimmy sees a bunch of convenient submarine parts strewn about, so he figures he can use the giant crane to construct his own vehicle with them. This begins a platform jumping segment where you climb boxes and swing on ropes to reach the crane. With these controls, it's a lot harder than it should be. But AWE did something good here. In certain areas, if you fall off, it brings you right back where you were. Again, don't let the graphics or controls deceive you. These developers care about their game and are willing to put anti-frustration features into it. You can also go explore this boat and other places on the dock. It isn't necessary, but it's nice to have the option. I always love being able to explore a game. There are also collectibles, so there's some amount of incentive. Also, I should mention that when you die, Jimmy brings himself back with a time travel device. It's nice that they thought about an in-universe way to bring you back from the dead, but it does raise a few questions. Imagine all the problems Jimmy could solve by just reversing time. He could have just gone back a few seconds and stopped himself from ever using the machine that started this whole thing. He could have also saved Carl and Cindy from being abducted in the first game. I don't know, it's best not to overthink it. Once you reach the crane, you have to lift the submarine parts and bring them together to magically construct it. That's totally how building works. I wish there was more stuff you could pick up and drop, just to add some variety. 
But once you beat it, you unlock a Jimmy Neutron version of Subnautica. Now I'm simultaneously terrified of the ocean, but also oddly fascinated by it, so I was looking forward to this level. It's also cool that you can swim up to the surface. It's nice to move around the ocean, but your submarine is extremely slow and it's really hard to maneuver it the way you want to go. It's unfortunate that the controls have to be so wonky in this, because aside from that, I love this level. You're trying to reach Negatron's base, but there's so much you can see if you just explore the ocean. You can see different fish, swim through sunken ships, and find the ruins of an abandoned civilization. Hey, are those statues of Hugh? I knew Jimmy's dad was an ancient god all this time. Explains a lot when you think about it. You can also use your submarine's claw to move rocks out of your way. If you look to your left, you'll see the Baraki fighting for the Mask of Life. Now again, as much as I love this stage in concept, the submarine controls can be the biggest hazard here. Check this out. It's easy to trap yourself if you try to explore the sunken ships. Your submarine also takes damage whenever you hit a wall, so these things are death traps that don't really give any payoff. This one gives you a key to a secret passageway, and it literally has a key painted on the outside of it. That's hilarious. The ship's whole purpose was to carry that key. So once you fly through this whirlpool, you open Negatron's secret passage with a crystal you found. Then you swim through this large tunnel and return to Negatron's base. Also, be warned, these screens that appear at the end of every level are not pause screens. Don't be like me and get up to get a drink of water only to come back and find yourself missing cutscenes or getting obliterated by enemies. So you're able to teleport back to your own dimension and Negatron is unleashing havoc on it. Herman also comes to his senses and decides to go after you, declaring himself the Hermanator. If I didn't know his real name, I'd assume that's like the Terminator, but he gives you hernias. From here, you can explore the museum and see the different exhibits. You can also play this Lunar Lander-style minigame for bonus points. From there, you can either access your computer Vox or go out one of the doors to activate a storyline. Let's start with Carl's. Negatron gives Carl a black flurp, turning him into a giant and making him devastatingly hungry. To stop him, Jimmy needs supplies to build an invention and a ton of food from Sporkos. I prefer McSpanky's myself. The cutscenes are actually kind of hilarious. Give me, uh, 6,000 Sporko burgers with cheese, please. Would you like to Sporko-size that for just 29 cents extra? Uh, sure. Would you like fries with, uh... Did you say 6,000? Yes. Is there a problem? Um, um, okay, um, that's like a really big order. So I can give you part now and you can pick up more at the window of any Sporko's location in town until the order is complete. And thank you for eating at Sporko's. Great. That should be enough food even for Carl. Here you go. Hey, kid. How can I help you? Okay, um, give me a lead pipe, a spatula, a big spring, and a case of duct tape, please. Building a food shooter for a rocket ship, are you? Yep. Good luck. Bye now. Jeez, how much money does Jimmy have? I'm sure his inventions sell for a decent price, so maybe he can afford 6,000 burgers along with the other supplies. So like the submarine stage, this is a cool level that suffers from unfortunate controls. You need to shoot food into Carl's mouth, but it's hard to stop and aim without him hurting you. You can pick up food to use as ammo and neutrons for extra health. You're gonna need an abundance of both. Once you satisfy Carl and turn him back to normal, you get a strange cutscene. Aw, oh, Jimmy. You still sweet on Cindy? I thought you weren't interested in girls just yet. No, no! Ugh. Let's just say I need to right some wrongs. Well, okay, Jim. Whatever you say. Now that you're back to normal, where's Cindy? Why would I tell you? You just ignore me again, Jimmy. You know, I thought we were best friends. At least we were until she got into the picture. Wow, that was a quick 180. Where did that sudden anger come from? So you head back to the museum and you can explore again. You slide down these stairs if you try to climb them, but if you're determined enough, you can jump to the very top and see this exhibit where you can kick planets around. Your reward for showing such skill is the ability to throw off the orbit of the entire galaxy. Continuing the story, Negatron turns Miss Fowl into a mummy at the top of a pyramid, so you have to save her in the Egypt exhibit. This section honestly gave me the biggest headache out of them all. There are so many moving platforms you have to jump to, and a lot of them are hard to reach. Also, you have the option to use the bathroom. Uh, wait here. I'll be right back. Ah, much better. Now let's go! 
And why exactly was it necessary to animate that? So you avoid sandstorms and reach this puzzle where you have to combine the colored gemstones to match the color on the door. It's an interesting puzzle, but one that would have confused my child self. At least there are only three gems, so it isn't the hardest game of deduction. Once you reach the pyramid exhibit, you climb to the top and save Miss Fowl. But the stage isn't over yet. Negatron pays a visit to your home and traps your parents in tombs. Now you have to save them by finding two keys. Also, come on, are you telling me you can't fit through those bars? So you go through this dark tunnel into a room where you have to step on the right floor panels to avoid falling through the ones that collapse. Just remember, in the Latin alphabet, Jehovah begins with an I. After that, you start this platform jumper that gave me such a hard time. I needed a brain blast of my own to get through this. Oh, I'd better try that again. Then you reach a tomb where robot mummies come after you. The door in the back doesn't open until you take them all out. I'll admit, in the darkness, it can be scary when you lose sight of a mummy and it sneaks up on you. If only Libby were here to command them. After you slay the mummies, you find the first key and head through another door down a rainbow slide. Yes, that same music was used in the Spongebob games and the AWE Scooby-Doo 2 game. They really like this track. I mean, I do too. Then you reach this puzzle where you have to raise or lower a water level by flipping these switches to control it. It requires a lot of brain work. I was stuck on this stage for an embarrassingly long time. Once you solve it, you go through a death trap platformer to find the other key. Then you save your parents. Also, check out this unsubtle alcohol reference. What's this black flirp you're talking about? I've never heard of it. So, where do you have it hidden, huh? I won't tell Mom. Well, I have a crate of it hidden in the garage. For those days, Mom turns yeah, grizzly, if you know what I mean. So now let's go save Libby. Fox has been reprogrammed and beams her into a digital world. You follow her and fight computer bugs with this vacuum-shaped machine that shoots. This stage is... oddly relaxing. The stakes don't feel too high, you just keep drifting along in your vehicle and occasionally shooting. After that Egypt stage, I really needed something mindless like this. It has a final boss, but it's also easy. Looks like it's in the wrong video game, though. The Banjo-Kazooie studio is just down the block. Once you save Libby, you can check out your lab and see that Negatron has used your time machine to change the past. So now you have to chase him through different time periods. It's fitting that this video is coming out in October because you start off by going to a prior year's Halloween. See, this is a holiday special. Look at all the kids in costumes! How am I supposed to find Negatron? Oh. Okay, stop right there, Negatron! Ah, Neutron! How have you been? Keeping busy? <laughs> I didn't come here to talk. I came to stop you! Stop me? You can't stop me! Not without a Neutron Field Disruptor! <laughs> I have a Neutron Field Disruptor! <laughs> yeah, the cutscenes during this part of the game are really funny. The stages are also fun to run around, even if they also use recycled music. You have to chase Negatron around and damage his shield until he teleports away. Then you get a Christmas stage. See, this also works as a Christmas special. You can watch this video in December, too. You'll never catch me! Not without a scooter! Ha <laughs> ha! Goddard Scooter Mode. Oh! This time, you chase him on a Goddard scooter. It's a lot more challenging than the Halloween stage, and you get to explore a Christmasified Retroville, going to the same locations you saw in the first game. Then once you destroy his shield, you follow him to the 4th of July. Wow, this really is a multi-holiday special. Now you get to use your jetpack. Neutron! You found me again? Ah, doesn't matter. You can't catch me without, uh... uh you have a jetpack, don't you? Yep. Uh, gotta go, bye! Okay, that made me laugh. The jetpack was one of my favorite features in the first game, so you can imagine I enjoyed this stage. It's a little hard to control, but it feels good to fly again. Once you beat Negatron, he returns to the present and you follow him. The Herminator then takes your mailbox thinking it's you. Then you show up at home. No poltergeist in your TV this time, but you can bounce on the bed now. What's unfortunate is that this is the only part of the game where you can explore the house, and if you hit the question mark at the front door, you continue the story regardless if you're finished exploring or not. 
I never like when games do things like that without giving you a proper warning. So you head to the Black Flirt Factory where Negatron and Cindy are getting ready to kiss. I think I L-O-V-E you, Jimmy Neutron. No! So before you can proceed, the Herminator shows up to attack. This commences a boss fight. Unfortunately, this boss fight is hard, but not for the reasons you'd expect. The Herminator chases you throughout the warehouse, but he isn't very smart, so he doesn't stay on your trail for long. This makes it easy to lose sight of him when you're trying to attack with your burp zooka. That's nasty. You also have to collect ammo throughout the stage. Other than that, it isn't too complicated. You beat him and head into the factory. You explore for a bit, jumping across platforms and trying not to become part of the mixture, then you reach this weird sort of mini-game. You have to shoot the black flirps on this conveyor belt without hitting the purple ones, but it goes on for a really long time. I kept thinking this was just a mini-game for bonus points because it seemed like it went on forever. I even thought my game bugged out because I couldn't go any farther beyond this point. But no, it just goes on for an incredibly long time. Then Negatron shows up with Cindy. Then he gets defeated in a zany and comical manner. I am unstoppable! I am all-powerful! I am... <laughs> Trapped in a vat. Now to get Cindy back to normal. But it isn't over yet. He's unleashed his robot dinosaurs on the city, so you have yet another rocket ship mission where you have to destroy them. It's just like the Carl mission, and just as difficult, too. You save the city by shooting at all the dinosaurs until they blow up. Again, it's fun, just a little hard to control the rocket. Once the dinos are defeated, Negatron shows up and swears revenge before teleporting back to his dimension. Carl also sounds oddly confrontational here. Uh, Jim? Yeah, Carl? So, that's the evil you from another dimension? Yep. Okay, um, aren't you gonna stop him? Nope. Why not? Simple. I planned a little surprise for him when I was trapped in his dimension. What kind of surprise? So back in Negatron's dimension, Herminator puts him in a cage, believing he's actually good Jimmy. This brings us to the end of Jimmy Neutron vs. Negatron. So, what do we think about this one? It's alright. I've heard people say they prefer this to the original, but I think I disagree. While there is a lot to appreciate here, I like the open-world feel of the first game. This one was a lot more linear, with more driving and puzzle-based locations. While that sounds good in concept, it made the faulty controls a lot more apparent than they were the first time around. But at the end of the day, I still enjoyed myself. There's a lot to do, a lot of places to explore, and an interesting conflict. Fans of Jimmy Neutron could probably enjoy this. Strange in some areas, but not too bad. I guess one of the downsides to the writing being better in this is that we don't get as many hilarious cutscenes. You never know a good thing until it's gone. But both of these games have their merits, and I respect AWE for giving Jimmy Neutron a shot. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.